I'm John Lamar. Um, I joined the Navy in 1967, July of 1967, and left for Vietnam in May of 1968 to join the Mobile Riverine Force, um, which operated in the Mekong Delta. We carried elements of the 9th Infantry throughout the Mekong on various types of operations, um, trying to bring the war to the Viet, Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese. Our mission was unique because the naval operations and part of the naval group did not have a small boat uh, river type operation in place before Vietnam. This was something that came out of what the French were doing during their days in Vietnam and um, with some degree of effectiveness, um, the U.S. put a lot more effort, a lot more um, resources behind that and developed a fairly large um, means of running combined operations. And combined operations mean that Army uh, and Navy working jointly together to bring the war to the Viet Cong. The last time the U.S. had a combined operation force was during the Civil War. General McClellan and General Grant used this type of operation fairly effectively against the Southern armies. And it was comprised of what we would call troop carriers to move men around, but also had uh, mortar barges for shelling enemy positions. We, in turn, had something similar to that. We had um, floating pontoons that had 105 howitzers. So we, in effect, had a mobile fire base that we could move anywhere in the Delta to bring artillery to bear on a, on a specific operation. There are a number of reasons the Mekong Delta was important uh, to the U.S. It was a, the largest population area of the country. Half the population lived in the Mekong Delta. The Mekong produced uh, rice enough for the entire country and also with a surplus to export. Although later on in the war, the VC were uh, fairly effective at disrupting that and, and Vietnam became a net uh, importer of rice. The Mekong River runs about 2,600 miles coming down from Tibet, weaving through Laos and Cambodia and Thailand and Burma. And along the way, it picks up a lot of silt and a lot of nutrient-rich um, silt that's deposited in some areas of the Delta 200 feet deep so that the ability to grow rice was probably the best in Southeast Asia because of that. And it was well recognized that he who controlled the Mekong Delta would control the country eventually. And that's why for the Viet Cong, it was an important objective for them to control and dominate the, uh, the Mekong Delta. I was part of River Squadron 13, and it was River Assault Division 131. The type of boat I was on was called a Tango Boat, uh, which was an abbreviation for Armored Troop Carrier. The boat number was 13111. Uh, we had a seven-man crew with a senior enlisted uh, man as the boat captain. Uh, there were five gunners and a uh, radio man and, uh, and the, the boat helmsman. My job on that boat was a 20-millimeter machine gunner. The MRB, as it was called, would move up and down the main rivers in the Mekong Delta to provide a base of support for our operations. And we could cover well, 150 miles in a matter of a day or so. The um, boats would then load troops either from a ship or from a local base, uh, the biggest being Dong Tam, which was located near the province capital of Mito. And elements of the 9th Infantry would operate with us in an attempt to bring the war to the Vietnamese. We um, could carry 40 um, fully equipped infantrymen. We had, on our type of boat, had a, a helo pad so that we could medevac back. Wounded personnel off, and also as far as exchanging personnel if we needed to bring um, new people on board, get resupplied, we could land the Huey a Huey helicopter on our boat. As far as being on operation, normally we would go out anywhere from five to 50 boats, depending on the size and the nature of the operation. We would um, load out the troops and the supplies. We would then move to the area of operation. We would insert the troops um, many times after a heavy beach preparation to take out any 
uh, enemy positions that might be set up for ambush of the ground troops or of the boats. In many occasions, we did get ambushed as we were moving in to, um, to land the troops or en en route to the area where the operation was to be conducted. We'd start out usually four, three or four in the morning, and we would probably be loading troops off one of the barrack ships. The, we would get underway probably by 4.30 and be steaming towards our destination, which may be a couple hours or half a day away. We would then enter, typically that would be done on a, on a larger river. We would then enter the smaller canals or channels. Many times we would go in and be unopposed. We would insert the troops and there wouldn't be any contact at all. Other times, as soon as we made the entrance into the smaller channel, we would be ambushed. Um, and for the most part, we'd be able to push through those ambushes. I don't think there was one time when we didn't get through. We would then, after um, prepping the beach or engaging the enemy in an ambush, insert the troops and there would be many times designated beaches where we would be Red Beach, somebody else would be Blue Beach, and somebody else would be Green Beach. And that was a method of keeping um, control of the operation and moving troops in, control, in a controlled fashion. So we would then drop our ramp on the front of the boat, the troops would disembark, usually fairly quickly because for whatever reason they didn't like being on our boats and uh, we didn't much like the job they were doing when they were wading into the beach up to their neck in mud and so I guess it was a uh, kind of a rocky marriage between the two of us. Neither one liked what the other one did. There was one uh, mission that we were on that we had inserted troops around 8 in the morning and by noon we had had one killed and 25 wounded and hadn't made any contact at all. It was all from booby traps and the Viet Cong were very effective at setting booby traps, very effective at setting ambushes and after the initial fight blending back into the jungle and basically disappearing. We had another operation which was a one-day operation where we inserted troops, they swept the area for the entire day, felt the area was clean, we loaded up probably 500 to 600 men and began pulling out, getting back to the main river and were ambushed probably by 150 BC and it was as though they grew out of the ground. We didn't know where they came from, but we got hit pretty hard at, at, at that time. Another type of boat that helped with this type of operation was the Monitor and that had a 105 tank turret on the front of it and was very effective against all but the heaviest bunkers and with certain types of rounds was very effective against uh, personnel. We would typically load out the troops, um, begin moving them upriver and interspersed between our troop carriers would be the monitors and the zippos. Out in front of the column we would have two boats that would be mine sweeping. Um, the Viet Cong were very effective in setting what they called command detonated mines from the, uh, from the shoreline or from the bank of the river. These were wire uh, controlled and the boat would get over the top of a mine, it would be detonated and in some cases sank our boats. With the boats that would be running mine sweep, they would run a chain drag system along the bottom of the river and cut any wires that would be controlling these command detonated mines. Um, this method worked very effectively and allowed the column to get through to the, to the area that we were operating in. Um, once there, we would lower the ramps on our boat and insert the troops. Once on the ground, they would begin their sweep operations and we would then provide support for these ground operations. In some cases, it would be act as a blocking station to try to contain the enemy. Uh, in some cases, it would be provide resupply for the troops on the ground. Our charter was a little bit different. The swift boats and the PBRs, which were the patrol boat river, smaller craft, um, were used to interdict the supply of men and arms and materials for the Viet Cong war effort they did not, for the most part, haul large complements of troops to actually take the fighting to the Viet Cong. Um, 
what they provided for us was, was a significant reduction in the arms flow to the Mekong Delta, and in turn made it more effective and forced, made it more effective for our soldiers to fight the war, but also forced the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese to move most of their supplies down the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which was much more difficult a trip than loading up a junk or a series of sandpans and coming down the coast and moving in large quantities with very little effort. So they significantly helped reduce the flow of arms and ammunition to the Mekong Delta. Hi, I'm Don Young. Uh, I was a gunner's mate third class with the Swift Boats in Vietnam. Went over there in May of 1966. Uh, we opened up our base in Quinh Yan. Uh, was with Crew 76. There were six people on a boat. Um, five enlisted men and one officer. We, uh, when, when we went over there, we brought over six boats into Da Nang, left two in Da Nang and went down and opened our base in Quinh Yan with the other four. Our mission primarily was to stop the infiltration of arms and contraband uh, from the uh, VC to the south. Um, we inspected junks. Uh, Every day we were on patrol. Primarily board and search missions is what our mission was. We would usually stop twice a day, usually for lunch or, or dinner. Um, and then it was constant back and forth in your patrol area. At night we would go into a, a, a two-man or a two-section uh, watch where three guys would be sleeping, three guys would be up. But if you come across a sampan or a junk that needed to be searched, then the other three guys had to get up. So when you were pretty much up for the 24 hours that you were on patrol, catching short little cat naps if you could at night. Depending on where, where, what area we were going to that day, we would get up at a, a, in the morning, uh, and, the and where we were going would depend on what time we would leave because we had to relieve the next boat on station at, say, 7 and 8 o'clock in the morning. So if it was the furthest way, we would leave earlier and um, we would head out to our patrol area, relieve this boat on station, and then we would start to patrol back and forth, back and forth. Some days it was boring, some days we saw some action. We would eat whatever they gave us for to take out. Um, a lot of times we would uh, search the sand pans and you would come across a fisherman that had a load of fish that would like to trade something or you would, you, we could trade for fish or rice and uh, kind of make, broke the monotony up of the uh, food that they ended up giving us to take out on patrol. We had uh, a twin 50 forward and a single 50 aft mounted over a 81 millimeter mortar. We had uh, M16s on board, a uh, shotgun and uh, 38 caliber pistols. When we were on patrol, each, each guy had a, a job to do when he was there, but primarily we were all pretty much cross-trained into each other's job. The gunner's mate knew how to work the radio, the radio men knew how to work the guns, we had a little bit of training on the generators and engines. We could get them started if we had to. We each had to know each other's job. Uh, we were just like a small little family all into this little tiny boat. I, I would say we did. Uh, we, when we went over, we were fairly the, the, new, the new guys on the block. And uh, it didn't take them long to realize that we were there and uh, the um, primary, I feel the primary reason that they built the Ho Chi Minh Trail is we shut them down by moving their supplies by water and they ended up having to move it by land and uh, we put a big hurt in them. Um, these are a couple of fellows that were killed over there in the uh, time I was there, Alvin Levine here, he was a gunner's mate. He was lost at sea, we never did find him. Uh, 
went over the side and searched for him for days, never did find him. Danny and Terry were both killed on uh, these little uh, Boston whalers we had that were for the inner harbor patrol areas. And they pulled up alongside of a sampan one night and they threw a homemade grenade in on him and Danny and Terry were both killed. And Terry and I were pretty good, close friends, I guess. Uh, night before he died, we were, he, I was going on patrol that day and he was going out the next day and kind of sat around in the bar in the base there, talked about what we were gonna do when we got home. And uh, he never made it. These operations could go on from anywhere from one day to, I think the longest one we were on was 45 days between inserting, picking up, providing the support activities. We did have, whether well, it was a short or long mission, um, a pretty good access to artillery support and also air support from Huey gunships, from Cobra gunships, from the fixed wing aircraft uh, such as the F-4 Phantoms. Um, these pilots were very good, gave us very good close ground support when we would be in an ambush situation. So we would call in for airstrikes, in some cases direct them, and in many cases there would be a spot air aircraft up there to lay in the white phosphorus marking rounds so that the fixed wing aircraft would know where to, where to drop their bombs. And it was effective. I'm, I'm sure they saved a lot of our lives by the intensity of the, the bombing that they conducted. After the operation, retrieving the troops, heading back to the um, boats, the main ships of the Mobile Riverine Force, um, there's usually a pretty good sense of relief once we got back onto the wide portion of the river because ambushes were very few when you were on the larger rivers. And if you did get shot at, it was such, at such a distance that it wasn't very accurate. Once back at the barrack ship after an operation, um, if we had been in a firefight, uh, all the weapons would be torn down, cleaned. And for my particular weapon, that would take probably two hours to really do a complete job on it. And nobody shortchanged that part of the job because your life was in your hands. And, um, that was probably the most critical part of what we did, keeping the boat in operational condition and keeping our weapons in good firing condition. Um, after that, sometimes they'd even have a, a barbecue for us when we got back to the ships and we'd have our standard issue of two cans of beer and a, a couple of steaks and uh, bed down for the night. But at night, it was, there was always somebody standing watch on the boats and many times we would um, end up patrolling around this mobile base because a couple of our ships had been sunk by swimmers, and uh, so we had to continually patrol the mobile base, trying to, to keep the swimmers from attaching mines to our ships. I believe from the military standpoint, we did win the uh, river and the coastal war, and that the effectiveness clearly shows that we reduced the flow of men, material, um, and severely limited the operations, especially after the 1968 Tet Offensive. Uh, on the side, on the political side, um, we did not win that part of the war. Um, it was we did various operations to try to win the hearts and minds of the people, but um, the effort and the direction was not sufficient to really accomplish that objective. So I'd have to say that we won the military, but we lost the political war. We didn't understand much about the political side of things. Day-to-day -day life was trying to stay alive, uh, keep your buddies alive, and uh, survive. It was real survival. When they talked about, you know, hey, we're going to do this medical operation, you know, take a doctor into this village and help patch up the people, for us it was downtime. You know, we figured we probably wouldn't be shot at that day. Um, but it wasn't within us to understand that part of the war. We were not trained to do that. Um, We'd rather deliver bullets than Band-Aids, basically. I think part of the problem, too, was the level of corruption within the South Vietnamese government. We didn't understand that at the time. And I think that was very detrimental to the, the spirit of the fighting forces of the South Vietnam, because that army caved in so rapidly that even the North Vietnamese were surprised at how quickly the South Vietnamese army caved in. Uh, we certainly were surprised. We thought we 
between the training and the equipping, they should have been one of the best armies in the world. But when it came down to the, um, the determination and the understanding and the desire, I guess it becomes down to a desire thing, how badly do you want freedom? How badly do you want to win? They didn't have it. And, you know, April 30th, 1975, tells the whole story. It could happen again. It could happen tomorrow. I don't think the American people yet have come to any degree of understanding, and um, hence we have this museum to try to teach them about this, because if we don't understand what happened and why it happened, we certainly will do it again. And um, this world is a dangerous place. You have to understand um, what it is, what the motivations are, what drives people, and I think we could easily repeat that. I hope not. <laughs> On our particular boat, we didn't have anybody wounded or killed during the whole year, the first year that I spent in country. and. I didn't have to deal with my direct crew members being wounded, although in our river division, we were one of the few boats that didn't have anybody wounded or killed. And I think dealing with the loss where you'd, you'd know somebody, you'd have um, breakfast with them in the morning and they'd be dead by that afternoon, and it was real tough dealing with that. You ended up stuffing the feelings, you ended up putting it off. There was never any closure to that type of thing. And um, even today, that's still, a, still an issue with me, that, you know, I'd like to know what happened to some of those guys. That the last thing you remember, they were loading on a medevac chopper and, and gone. And yeah, you might hear that they made it to Japan, but you don't know what happened beyond that point. So I think from the standpoint, it's, it's the, the loss was the tough, the tough part of it. Seeing the suffering of the, uh, the Vietnamese people, the ones that weren't directly involved in the war, I mean, the, the civilians, the children especially, we, we hauled on um, civilian casualties and medevac them out. and. It was very sad to see a six-year-old girl that had been mangled by whatever and, um, and realize that this thing we call war really wrecks havoc on the civilian population, especially when we're fighting it in such a densely populated area. Night before he died, we were, he, I was going on patrol that day and he was going out the next day and kind of sat around in the bar in the base there and talked about what we were going to do when we got home. And uh, he never made it. He was a little Boston whaler that Terry and Danny were patrolling in when they got killed. Being there was tough. See you.